How are things going at ESTCN? I always feel like I'm talking about a sports channel. Hi, um, we've been kind of trying out some of the resources. Um, at, at our workshop, we did the process mapping and we did aim statements. And um, some of our people aren't here, so I'm not sure what else. So we're, we're trying to see evaluation now with some of our clinics. Yeah, and I think the process mapping in particular works really well. Uh, people seem to like it and seem to see how it was going to add value to uh, involve their team and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's gone quite well here. Great. Great. All right. Well, any last words from anyone on that topic? I was just going to ask if Jennifer here that if there was anything that the teams did not do that they see themselves going back to do over the next few months mm -hmm. or anything in particular. Knowing that we talked about maybe doing some catch up, I guess I was just curious whether or not there was particular items that people would like to have time to go back to. It's almost sounding, Jennifer, like most of the teams. Yeah decided to do all of the items in test box one, so it's more a matter of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Good to know. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. And again, if you, if anything comes up and you're, you're, you know, feel free to, to pop it into the chat box and we'll, we'll capture your, your thoughts. Uh, all right. Uh, so the test box too, dun, 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 dun. As you can see, we've got a new set of contents to work on. So these are the potentially better practices. Now, this might be a term that I'm not sure if you're familiar with yet. It's, um, it's what we're calling the items in the test boxes. And the idea is you've probably heard the term best practices before. Um, and we think that maybe these will be best practices. And from the research, there's certainly what is indicated as um, things that have been working for other teams. But we don't know yet whether these are going to be those in Alberta. And so they're potentially better than what is already happening. And so that's part of the reason why we're calling them that. It's, it's, um, these are the things we'd, we're asking you to test and see if, in fact, they are better practices. So PBTs, potentially better practices, it's a bit of a mouthful, but, but uh, that's, that's what we're calling them. So the first one is getting ready for continuity, and we're going to hear more about that uh, in a moment from Sue. The second one is effective communication for care planning, and Julie will explain that one to us. I'll be talking to you, it's Michelle, um, about coordinating today's work together. Then we have determining and monitoring panel confirmation rates. Um, actually, this was the local Alberta research findings. My apologies. That one, we can remove that one. That one we're moving to a, a, later, a later box. Um, and the last one is running EMR searches. So Lori Chilma will talk to us about these last two. All right. So. The first one, getting ready for continuity, Sue, if we can give Sue the baton here, she can talk to us about the slides. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so getting ready for continuity. Um, this test box um, item is to uh, support teams in um, really kind of above the line activities. Um, so developing a shared understanding of the importance of continuity, um, using data to understand and inform the practices continuity. So this is looking at panel reports as well as reports uh, available, physician reports from uh, the Health Quality Council of Alberta, HQCA. Um, looking at developing a shared understanding of the 
provider behaviors that contribute to continuity, and uh, getting teams um, prepared to participate uh, in the Central Patient Attachment Registry, which is a technical enabler for continuity. Now, um, try not to get overwhelmed, just as we were talking about um, test box items. We've put a lot of information into this uh, test box um, uh, for you to use. And there is no expectation for you to be um, getting through this in this cycle. We expect that um, you will come back and revisit test box items over the next few months. But we wanted to include the information so that you would have um, choices of, of things to focus on with your teams um, as you're starting to talk to them um, more about uh, continuity. So um, just a little bit on why we're focusing on continuity. Um, as Dr. Richard Luanchuk stated, having a family doctor being able to access the most, uh, the uh, fam being able to access the family doctor and more importantly continuity of care with a family doctor is probably the single most important thing a healthcare um, system can provide to its population. Um, there is absolutely overwhelming evidence um, to support the benefits um, of continuity, and you will find uh, much more information about this um, in the test box. We have some really nice data from Alberta um, that's, that supports um, the benefits of conti continuity. So when we think about uh, continuity, it really is the quality of patient care over time with a primary care provider and those connections across healthcare events and providers. So when we think about continuity, we're uh, looking at relational continuity, um, informational continuity, and management continuity. And the test box will take you through um, each of those definitions and uh, the importance of each. Now, um, to date, uh, we have been focusing in Alberta on four areas to improve uh, continuity. So this is not a new thing that we're working on. Um, we're just putting particular focus on it. Um, there's been a focus on patients' medical home, capacity building for PCNs, a focus on panel, and also a focus on access. And some PCNs and teams may have started with access, some started with panel, others started with building capacity. It's been a different journey um, for, for each of the teams out there. And here are some examples <laughs> of the current and emerging uh, primary care initiatives that um, are aligned to co continuity. So you can see that um, PACT is, is there, um, although um, many of these would actually fall in, in helping to improve uh, many different types of continuity. So um, with respect to management continuity and PACT, I would argue that it also, um, PACT is also supporting relational continuity and in informational continuity. But think of continuity as the common thread that is going through all of these um, initiatives and, and uh, on the work that we're doing towards patients' medical home. So um, you may have heard um, that we're um, working on a, a continuity campaign. Uh, continuity is a, a main focus um, uh, as we move forward in next steps around patients' medical home. And uh, this is uh, just the, the new aim, which is trying to get continuity uh, to over 80% um, in the province. And so stay tuned over the next uh, few months uh, to hear about what the timelines are associated with this aim, because you'll notice that that aim doesn't have a timeline uh, right yet, but um, we should be hearing more information about that um, over the next few months. So what's in the test box for you? 
So we have some uh, self-reflection questions um, that will um, help teams to think about um, their behaviors um, that help support continuity. And we also have uh, the continuity challenge, um, which is a slide deck um, that will um, help you in supporting your teams and understanding continuity. Um, so it is uh, designed as a quiz. Um, it's a series of questions to pose uh, with teams um, with supporting information after each question. And it can be used in a variety of ways and you can pick and choose the content uh, you wish to use. You may pick one question per meeting or you might chunk them in a way that um, makes sense to your team. Uh, it's totally up to you how you want to use it and we look forward to hear uh, from you how, how you have been using and, and if it was helpful. Now remember as uh, when you're going through the slide deck um, that if you have any questions at all about how to um, uh, uh, present information or if you have any questions about it, we've tried to build out the speaker notes um, with information um, that may be helpful to you. But if you have any questions, please contact um, your improvement advisor. We're here to support you uh, in this. Any questions about this box item? We're good, Michelle. Okay, okay. okay. Um, so, Sue, I have a question for you. <laughs> Since um, we're talking about uh, care planning with PACs, can you can you uh, tell us about um, why continuity is so important around care planning? For sure. Um, so, so for uh, care planning, um, what we're we're really focusing on that um, um, very critical relationship between the patient and the provider and the team that supports that um, provider, and so um, when we're focusing on those patients, um, the the rising risk. Um, complex health needs, rising risk, um, not being managed, and particularly those that um, have not been seen in the last year, would suggest that that um, continuity to that provider may not be as strong as it could be. And so, so that is um, a critical piece um, around the care planning. Also, that care plan um, and that information that is in the care plan will help with informational continuity as patients are taking their care plan. Um, maybe they're um, taking them to the hospital um, uh, when, when they have to go in an ambulance and that provides information. Um, and, and so it helps with the informational continuity as well as the um, management of that patient as well. So it really goes through all of those streams of, of uh, continuity. So. Great. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. <laughs> all right, Lisa, if we can pass uh, control to uh, Julie now. Michelle, I don't seem to have this. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to actually pass it to um, to make oh. Julie a presenter. So I've given it back to Michelle. If you can just drive okay. that for Julie. Sure, sure. I I can drive for you, Julie. Just. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to move into looking at um, the effective communication for care planning, and so really looking at those patient-centered interactions in care planning. Um, of course, with our patients, but really also looking at how this might apply um, for for you guys as teams. Because what we know is that you know what we say and how we say it, and in fact the order that we may say it in, can really impact whether patients will engage um, in the care planning process with us, um, and also really what that might then look like for them to take on the actions that we're laying out in the care plan with them. 
So we want to um, look in this test box at starting to unpack what does um, good patient-centered communication or potentially better practices for patient-centered interactions look like when we're working with patients in the care plan planning process and also as a team, what might that look like um, for you as you're working together um, in huddles um, as you guys are working in the clinics together. Um, we know that the literature really tells us that um, good therapeutic communication can have an incredible impact on things like clinical outcomes or patient satisfaction, um, their ability to follow through with things. So we're going to start to look at what does that look like and how do we start doing some of that. So what we've built in this test box, Michelle, if you can just move to the next slide for me. Be able to advance it there. Perfect. Thank you. Um, is really as a team starting out to look together at what already does the team have? Because we acknowledge that um, across the teams, there's oh, probably a lot of experience already there. Um, and so opening up that conversation with your team to really acknowledge um, what previous trainings have occurred um, and really letting the team showcase um, what experience they already have. Um, we know that some um, people on the team may have had formal training, others may not, um, and it's a really good opportunity to kind of set the groundwork to understand what everyone's coming in with and what that looks like across the team. And from there then, it gives you a, a place, a starting place to determine what would patient-centered communication look like for us at the clinic and how then will that relate to um, what, what the patients experience when we do care planning with them. So what does that consistency need to look like and how will that impact our patients? So the first activity is really um, finding opportunities, whether that's in a huddle um, or perhaps, you know, it's sometimes just some water cooler talk that needs to occur to really be able to determine, you know, where is the team at with this? Are there some real champions in the team that have been trained in some patient-centered communication principles? Um, and you know, how can we leverage that and, and bring that into um, all members on the team? Um, so that's really what um, you know, we would encourage in that first activity in this um, section of the test box. And then if we move to activity two, Michelle, what we've developed is... How do you know this? Uh, based on the literature, what are some um, principles that we can use to really start to dig into what could our communication look can like? Can you find out for me? I'm just on. Um, both when we're working with our patients, but also when we're working with one another in the clinic. And so we've focused in on four um, our person-centered practice principles, and we've created a resource that can help define what are these principles and also give you examples of what does it sound like or what potentially it could sound like uh, when working uh, with a patient in the clinic. Um, so you'll see here the four principles are, the first one's called first ask then offer. Um, and the next is wait till eight, which I've heard Michelle reference a few times in these meetings, which is lovely. Um, and then invite the client to write in trial and error. So these are really four foundational um, principles that can help guide clinicians when working with their patients and to help ensure when we're working through the care planning process that we're operating from a lens of engagement for our patients um, as well as really helping to meet what their needs are. And this um, can be done in a, a bit of a PDSA cycle that you'll see here. So we've created a couple different options about how for you guys as coaches, you can bring this to your team and get this going. Um, so um, if we move to the, the next slide, Michelle, there's some tips here that we thought we'd spend a couple minutes just going through about how um, we might work through this with your teams. Um, so a couple ideas might be um, actually reviewing that sheet that you just um, saw on the last slide and is included in your package to review some of the examples and really hear.
from your team if it's something that they're currently doing. They may be calling it something different than what the title is that, that we call it, but they may actually be using it in their practice. So that sharing of how they're using it and what that sound like can be really valuable uh, for learning across the team. Um, so there are examples for you to draw from, but also then at, as I was um, sharing at team meetings or huddles, really looking at um, you know, how, how do we get this going and how can this actually even support the communication in the team? So can you use these when you have your huddles to guide the way that you guys are communicating with one another? Um, and that's where as coaches it's a really great opportunity for you to showcase how you use these principles. So you might need to, you know, take a minute to look at what they are and what they might sound like and then maybe take time to reflect for yourself about how might you incorporate that when you're bringing this to your team. So how might you language things? How do you make sure you wait till eight so that everyone has an opportunity to respond and engage? Um, and then how do we bring in things like invite the client to write? So we give some options there about what that can sound like for you at the clinic, knowing that um, it, you may not be able to provide uh, pads of papers and pens, so are there other ways that we can be thinking of bringing, um, bringing that into the team? And there's some examples in, in the guide that can help you through that. Um, but then the, really the next layer of that is to, to, as clinicians, to start to figure out how do we actually know if we're doing it, kind of like that litmus test. So I think I'm doing some of this, I'm, I'm trying it, how do we actually get it going a bit more consistently across the team? And that's where um, we've built in some options of activities that team members could try where they uh, may want to sit in with one another and observe an interaction um, or they might want to work through a scenario where they could use these principles in the interaction. Um, and we know that that may be new practice for um, some clinicians or providers. And so as coaches, you may need to spend a bit of time talking through a bit of that vulnerability, knowing that for many of us um, as clinicians and for myself included in that, it was a bit of a shift to have um, feedback from my team members about maybe how I, I would work through a, a situation and use principles to help guide how I phrase what I'm saying to patients. So you may have to create opportunity um, to do that uh, with your team and really acknowledge that this is about growth and that we need to create a safe environment to do that in. And then ultimately, we want to um, you know, look if there are opportunities to ask patients for their input or feedback, that that can really enhance um, how the team stays motivated or sees importance um, to maybe change their practice slightly. Because when we can hear back from our patients if it worked well for them, if the way that we were communicating, you know, fit for them and, and it seemed to help them and they felt the experience went well, um, it can really help us to keep going and, and try potentially new ways of doing things or really working on the things that we're doing well to do more of that consistently across the team. So I'm going to stop there and see if there's some questions about how you might um, look at incorporating some of these potentially better practices for communication um, with your teams or if you have any questions as coaches. And I'm not able to see the chat box, so I'm going to rely on the rest of the team here to bring those in if there are any, if there are anything in the chat box. And we'll definitely keep you posted. <laughs> Thank you. So that was eight. And I, um, I do want to also offer, if as coaches you're wondering about potentially how to use them, kind of that role modeling, there's definitely resources built in. But know that um, your IAs are a great resource um, and also you know, happy to have you reach out to me if you have you know, further questions or um, areas you want to explore about how to bring this to your team. And Julie, um, Brittany did type in that the wait to, wait to eight has been so helpful. So. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes it's a good one, but it's sometimes hard to do because eight sometimes seems like a very long time. But it's amazing what we can get when we give the space for people to respond. So I'm glad to hear you're finding it helpful. Awesome. Any last thoughts or comments for Julie? Very aware of counting to eight now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, again, if you have anything that comes up, that's the chat box is there. It doesn't even if it's out of context with what we're talking about, you can pop it in there. We'll make sure we we register your question and get back to you. All right. Moving on to coordinating today's work together. Um, and so, a lot of what this is about is is uh, what we call huddling. And I wanted to ask for all of you on the line, who has worked with a team or has been part of a clinic team? Some of you are, um, have done some internal clinic team work. Have done huddling in the clinic. So you can pop yes or no in the chat box, or if you feel like actually coming off mute, that's awesome too. We do it here at Life Med as well. Do you? Awesome. And so, what, tell us a bit about it. What does it What does it look like? Uh, it's just usually 10 to 15 minutes. It's usually first thing in the morning, um, before the clinic opens and before there's people in the waiting room. And lots of times, it's just an update about clinic um, practices, just a quick reminder about maybe verification rates or um, anything that maybe just needs a quick reminder to be in the forefront of you know all of our minds for the day. Great, fantastic. And I see that um, that Brittany says that good sound they do it every morning. Leslie's done it at the Royal Alex. Ariel um, says they've done morning huddles at times when lots of changes happening, but they're not doing them on a regular daily basis. Kathy says they've trialed it, but it seems to drop off. Interesting. Um, yeah, and, and we can talk a bit about that. Um, 15 minutes with the team, Brittany says, review on-call messages, hospital discharge, plan for the day, clinic updates, and knowledge sharing. Yeah, so it sounds like most of you have a sense of what huddles are. And they are different than what clinics are often used to. Clinics, many clinics will have the occasional um, team meeting which is usually a little bit more formal and a little bit more inclusive and it's um, you know, sitting down and planned. And so huddling can be a new concept for a lot of clinics. And there's a few things that you want to make sure they, they truly understand that a huddle is meant to be quick. It's short by nature, um, 15 minutes maximum. Um, and as they were talking about, it typically happens first thing in the morning before the clinic starts. Some teams will actually rehuddle before the afternoon clinic starts. And then there's other types of huddles. So um, some teams have a, a rule that if they've had a completely crazy blowout day where, where things have happened, they'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, quick huddle after after clinics done, just to really briefly go over what happened, what did we do well, what could we have done differently if this happens again next time, to just kind of um, do kind of like a, um, with the M&M &M in the rounds, you know how they kind of rehash what happened, to make sure that it's, it's fresh in people's mind while you talk about it and, and have a plan for what to do if this happens again. And then there's also the very, very brief huddling that can happen when you're doing a PDSA. And so again, you're trying something out on one patient this morning. And so just in the hallway, we meet for literally two minutes between patients. How did that go? Uh, it was pretty good, but, but I think if we did it again this way, it might be better. Great, let's do it on another patient this morning. Fantastic, we'll talk about it at lunch. So it's, it's really quick. Huddling is quick. Now in the package that we're giving you um, and already on the website, we've put together a sample huddle checklist. So some of you may have already been looking over this. And these are sort of the types of things that teams will typically touch on in a, in a preclinic huddle. Um, and again, this is, we've, we've put this on the website in Word format so that teams can take this and adapt it, change it, make it their own. 
And a lot of teams just need this in the beginning when they're just getting started with huddles. And some teams find we just like having it every time. Um, and so it, again, it, there's no rules. It's just however it works best. So you can see um, it's touching in with the team. What are we dealing with? Is anybody away sick today? Um, how are we going to manage that? Who's going to cover for who? How will, we, how will we make sure things flow smoothly, that we coordinate our care today despite someone being away? Is anyone leaving early? Is there anything else we should know about with what's going on with the team? Um, and then some teams actually incorporate a little like um, something positive every morning, like um, talking, someone saying um, uh, something that someone did the day before that was really helpful to them. So again, sort of starting the day off on a positive note. So every team has their own culture and how they want to work it in. And then it's standing around the EMR typically. So wherever we meet, it's at a standard time. We, in front of the EMR, we go through the schedule for today. And everybody has different information. So you want to have, if possible, someone from reception in your huddle, as well as the people who are going to be seeing the patients that day. So who's coming in? Have we had any cancellations? Are we, uh, are we doing any squeeze-ins that maybe not everyone's aware of? Um, is there something about some of the patients coming in that the team should know? So as an example, is this patient grieving? And perhaps we want to be um, aware of that and how, how we're dealing with the patient today. Um, is this a patient who's often late? So maybe we can plan for that and get some other work done in the meantime so that it doesn't throw the day off completely. So just those sorts of little bits of information. And then can we offer opportunistic care while they're here? So if we see someone like, ooh, that person, wow, we haven't seen them in a few years. Like that's a name we haven't seen for a while. Maybe they're due for some screening. We should make a plan to catch them while they're here and get that in. Or maybe that's a patient who's actually really quite complex and could really benefit from a care plan. Let's catch them opportunistically while they're here and see if we can uh, use our scripting to get them to come in for a care plan appointment, a care planning appointment. Um, and, and then also any PDSAs that are going on. And then as I mentioned, some teams will huddle again in the afternoon to do kind of a, a briefer version of the same thing to regroup. And then again, that end of the day huddle is on here if there was uh, an incident that kind of blew the day out that you want to talk about. So this checklist will be available to you. I'm trying to just kind of look. There's a lot of chatting going on here. Um, Cheryl B says it works to do smaller groups multiple times a day. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing with huddles. They're, they're, you, you, if it's going to be a problem waiting for people to come, you, you huddle with who's there. Um, and they see we started doing conference calls for it as people were sometimes dispersed geographically, but then it becomes a lot less useful as not as much participation. Yeah. So it, it takes some trial and error to figure out what's going to work for your team in the context that you're in. Awesome. So when you introduce huddles, um, if you had a chance to look at the coach's guide that accompanies Test Box 2, you'll see that we put in there some of the common barriers that you might get. So teams sometimes have a bad taste in their mouth around meetings. And so they may assume that a huddle is just another formal meeting that's going to be a waste of time. Right? Um, and of course, in clinics, time is uh, something that there is not a lot of. So in, in the guide, there are some strategies for, um, for dealing with those barriers that, uh, that I've put up here, um, some ideas that you can think of to address those. And um, so have a look at that. Hopefully it, these teams will probably be quite, quite open and agreeable with because they are innovation hubs, they're innovators. Um, but moving forward, you might, you might need to use some of these uh, barrier blockers. Now the other aspect of huddling is EMR messaging. And so sometimes if you can't meet in person, um, the EMR messaging systems are actually quite an effective way to, um, to transmit information between team members um, quickly without actually having to meet in person. So this is another option that could be instead of or as well as 
the actual huddling. And so this is something that every EMR does a little bit differently. And you'll see in the test box document, um, we gave a few tips on some of the big EMRs, the major ones. But what you'll probably have to do if, if it's not clear to the people in your clinic, someone may have to, to take that away and go and look it up on the um, the, the help tool with the EMR and just do a bit of research and find out how the messaging works on that EMR. And then do some PDSAs. How could we use this to our advantage to coordinate our work better in the clinic? And most of them have a messaging system that may be specifically related to the patient. So the messages would stay attached to the patient chart. And then they may also have a different messaging system, which is more for the team. So it's not related to any particular patient. It's more just, uh, hey, can you join me in room two for after, after 3 o'clock, or something like that, or, or where do you want to go for lunch today? So it's, it's more of a team thing. So you may have heard me say a couple times already, um, this is something really good to PDSA. And so just a reminder about what that might look like um, for huddling. If you were doing a huddle PDSA, perhaps they plan they're going to do a huddle on Tuesday morning. Um, who would be optimal if they were there? And let's try out that sample checklist. Then they go and do, do they try the huddle in the morning? They go through it. Um, at the end of the day, they meet briefly, right? And they talk about how did that go? What um, what, what worked, what didn't work, and then they make revisions and try it again. So um, again, if you can just encourage the team to start thinking about testing things in this way, uh, PDSA, so that, um, so that they get used to the language and the, uh, the concept of, of model for improvement in their improvement work. So in the test box too, I just wanted to show you this, because if the team is kind of seeing having trouble seeing how is this going to work for us or how is this going to be a benefit for us? Is it worth our time? You may want to go through this example scenario. And so I'm just going to quickly read it to you. To you. Um, actually, you know what? I'm looking at the time now. I'm not going to quickly read it to you. I'm going to let you read it for yourself um, when you have a moment. But the key is that in this one very brief scenario that really only takes a couple minutes, you'll see that there is um, huddling covered. There's running queries covered, which is uh, coming up momentarily. It's another item in this test box. It talks about complex health needs uh, patients or a patient who would qualify in that complex health needs rising risk not managed. And there's an opportunistic uh, offer of care planning. It talks about scripting. It talks about EMR messaging and coordinated teamwork. So in this one very brief paragraph, you'll see all of that covered. So it might be helpful, again, if you're having a team that needs a little uh, coaxing. All right, so any questions? Again, I'm trying to look back in the chat box here. Um, so Ariel, yeah, I think one new. OK, Sorry. messaging happens at times. Cancellations do not book spots, but it is not clinic-wide, more the smaller clinic team who is dealing with the changes directly. Yeah, so that's great. So some, it's already happening in, in some sense, but if, for the teams that are already doing it, taking this on in the test box might be more of, um, are we using it to its full advantage? Could we expand it? Could we um, refine it a little bit more? Uh, so again, something to think about. All right, again, we've got about 10 minutes left. Any last thoughts or questions on this one before we move on? All right, so Lori Chilma is going to take it next for our last sections on the EMR part. And Lori, are you able to take control? I have taken control already. Thanks, Ooh. Michelle. All right, I'll uh, I'll dive right in and take us uh, into the last two sections. Uh, take us to the finish line here. So first, determining and monitoring panel confirmation rate. So, whoops, I'm not I'm not I'm not controlling. Oh, there we go. Um, so we heard earlier this 
in the call from Sue about continuity. And if continuity is what we're trying to achieve, then panel is one of the hows or one of our enablers. Um, if you have your team on board and do that work that Sue went through and they understand the impact of good continuity, the impact they can bring to patients in the system, then doing the panel processes and including running this panel confirmation rate is going to be a relatively easy sell for patients, or sorry, for the, for the clinic or for your teams. So remember, the panel processes are asking patients at every visit who their primary provider is, marking it in the appropriate place in the EMR, and then reviewing the list as a team. And then finally, using the list to plan your care, such as the care that you're doing with PACT. So when you have those processes in place, we want to know how well we're doing. And you'll see the QI language um, that we put here in the first bullet. If our outcome is a confirmed panel, the outcome measure is going to be the number of confirmed patients or the number um, or just the confirmed list that we produce. And then the panel confirmation rate is the process measure. That's the process that tells the team how well they're doing. So this is a really great time for yourself to review um, the quality improvement language and understanding around measures. And it's a really good, it's a simple example to start to engage your team around, around understanding quality improvement measures. Um, it's also a really good time to review the definition of a panel with the team. Of course, that definition being the group of patients who consider a particular physician or nurse practitioner to be their primary provider, and that primary provider agrees. Um, so without a confirmation rate on file, you can't consider a patient to be part of your panel by that definition. Um, like I mentioned earlier, teams are who are aligned to the importance of continuity um, are going to do this work well. Um, I wanted to cover the topic of incentives because incentives have come up um, for me a few times in a few of the forums that, that we've, we've been around. And so we've heard success stories from across the province from physician leaders, improvement facilitators have been sharing them, clinic staff have been sharing them, where they talk about how they've used incentives in their clinics to improve the confirmation rates. So this can be very effective, but for in your role as improvement facilitator or PACT coach, you need to introduce the topic to the right individuals, um, mainly the clinic leadership, um, and not just you know talk about it in the team meeting. So just every team culture is a little bit different. Leadership might not be open to providing incentives. Um, and then just also understanding the culture. Driving competition um, may work really well in some clinics and not in others. So it's really good to make sure that you understand the culture and, and the willingness um, for leadership around, around incentives. Um, and of course, incentives don't need to be monetary. A thank you note or putting some recognition on, on the improvement board um, can, can be really effective too. Uh, so the last tip I have for you around panel confirmation is to measure and share and measure and share and measure and share, uh, just like with all of our quality improvement, improvement measures. Uh, so the measure is fairly simple to do once the numbers um, are pulled from the EMR. So there's a ton of resources available on the top website. Specifically, we have um, the instructions on pulling the numerators and denominators in the EMR guides as well. Um, there's videos for, for the five or six major EMRs that show you how to pull the numbers and how to do the measure. So they're really um, just a few pages in the, in the guidebooks and really quick videos um, that, that you can watch to help you out uh, with your specific EMR. Um, and then, of course, with our QI work, we want to always show our progress over time on a run chart, um, and that run chart does to put that together for us, um, and it's in, it's in the test box material. Just remember, it doesn't need to be fancy like the one that you see here. Um, a manually created um, run chart works just as well. Uh, the important thing is, is that it's visible for all to see. So that's all I'm going to cover now for the panel um, confirmation rate measure. Are there any questions before I move on to the last section on EMR searches?
All right, was that eight? I didn't, I didn't count, but that felt like eight or, or longer. So, Chris, you can always um, pop something into the chat there as well. Oh, there's my questions. Slides. All right, so taking us to the finish line, um, running, running EMR searches. So I did notice that um, at the beginning when we were chatting, there were a couple of comments um, around your EMR search challenges. challenges. So building up in your EMR and, and the work that you did in test box one around standardization is definitely a slow process that, that can take some time. And so likewise with a lot of the data fields that you're trying to get in and standardize that would help you to routinely identify patients um, can be a slow process. Um, so we know a lot of clinics around the province with their panel processes, they're taking three years plus to, to establish their panel because they're just confirming those patients as they come through the door. And likewise, as patients come through the door and you start to use different uh, data fields in a standardized way, it's going to take a lot of time um, for you to build up the capacity and to be able to really run um, effective, effective EMR searches. So we're starting with some simple searches in the EMR in this test box item. And of course, in the last test box, we talked about standardization, which is, again, our critical foundation for leveraging and being able to search your EMR. So we have observed most, most teams um, involved in the innovation, you guys are fairly savvy on your EMR, um, but we think the simple exercises here and the concepts are, are just worth reviewing. And so the idea from the work here is really from our learnings at Toward Optimized Practice um, through the various initiatives we've done, we've done and supporting so many teams through various stages of EMR change, we've learned about um, the layering and what can be really effective for teams just starting to use their, their EMRs. Um, so I was up late last night baking that cake so I could take a picture to, to show you um, so we can talk about layering our learnings on um, and layering our searches in, in the EMR. Um, so for those of you that got on the call a few minutes early, you know that we were finishing a call um, with a group of physician leaders. And actually the conversation, if any of you um, were, were listening in that last few minutes of that call, was actually around um, quality improvement data. And one of the docs said something really great um, that I want to pass on to you here, is that after data is run for them and it's passed over to them, you have to give it a sniff test. And so that's really what we're doing here is we're, we're running through a little bit of a sniff test. And so in the test box, we're going through a really simple exercise, identifying patients um, without a visit. And we want to run those um, one by one. So run each of those searches one by one and then start to layer them, share them with your team, give them the sniff test um, to see if they work. And uh, check out the top EMR guides. They talk a lot about how the search functions work um, and make some suggestions for doing this. So I know that we are at 9 o'clock. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> taking us here to the finish line. So Michelle, um, with that, I will, uh, I will get the ball passed back to you to wrap us up. Actually, you should go to Jennifer. And while oh, you're that, I'll just mention that now I really want cake. So thanks for that, Laurie. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we were just wanted to finish off. It is nine o'clock with some of the important dates ahead. So what's coming up next? Can you see that slide? Just want to make sure. Um, yeah. So we've got we've got the materials up on the website. So Test Box Two materials. It's under the tools and resource section. Um, and from there, you guys can take it out to your clinic teams when you feel it is um, the best fit for time and and getting together with those teams. And then just highlighting the next Share and Learn, April 5th, and the next Test Box Coaches Prep will be April 11th. And I think that's it. That's we'll let people get off to their day. Thanks so much for everybody's time. And thanks to the presenters. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.